This is Face Palm America. I'm Beowulf Racklin. FacepalmAmerica.com is where you can go to get more information about the show. Listen to past episodes, connect with us on social media, and as always, you can uh, call or message us at 202-656-6271. I am not a tiller of the soil. Um, unfortunately, uh, my wife does uh, because she produces delicious vegetables uh, from her garden that uh, she lets me eat uh, every year. And and we're all lucky that people uh, are planting seeds around the world uh, to be grown into the food that we are, of course, dependent on. But the business of seeds in the year 2023 has become a a very complicated matter. And here to explain it to us a bit is uh, Jennifer Jewell. She is a gardener, a garden writer, and a gardening educator and advocate. Since 2016, she has written and hosted the national award-winning public radio program and podcast cultivating place and she is the author of what we sow on the personal ecological and cultural significance of seeds jennifer welcome to face palm america thank you so much for being here i'm so pleased to be here today thank you for having me so we know that climate change is a huge threat to life on this earth and to the ecosystems that have built up over the course of of time but um seeds and and their vulnerability and the extent of their spread uh, are critical to preserving those ecosystems as well aren't they they're also threatened by uh climate change for that matter yeah see you know it, it is as you already indicated um it is complicated, but yes, seed are the smallest, most mobile forms of most of the plants we know, we love, we eat, we rely on for ecosystem services. Um, there are approximately 300,000 species of flowering plants that comprise about 80% of the plants here on the planet. And those are the angiosperms, the seed bearing flowering plants. And so if anything in a plant's life is uh, imperiled, then their seed is also imperiled, perhaps. And so, you know, it's one of these things where we have to keep an eye on all parts of this system. And the seed is both the most tenacious, but also perhaps the most easily overlooked. And what parts of this global seed system would you say are most vulnerable right now are are being put under the most pressure by the kinds of of climate change that we've been seeing in the last decades we were talking before uh, we came on the air and discussing that uh, we lived not too uh, far from uh, one another, really, just a a few hours, you in Northern California and me in Southern Oregon. And uh, we talk a lot about uh, wildfire and uh, and, uh, and flooding and, and things like that. What what's getting at the seeds? What is uh, what is most vulnerable here right now? Well, I would say that in in my perspective, after doing several years of research on the sort of state of seed in our world, and that's seed as we know it in our own seed sheds, seeds of the, the native plants around us, the invasive plants around us, the seed in our vegetable gardens, our flower gardens. Um, it, it's not so much that the seed is in peril, it's that we are in peril of not understanding it and therefore not right. treating it with the respect and integrity that it it deserves and um and is to our best interest as we move forward in the world. So, you know, uh, when you think about the ways in which seed gets to us, which is often invisible to many of us, um it is, I think, important just as we have become accustomed to knowing more about our farmer, knowing more about our food, knowing more about our watersheds, that we as humans, but also specifically as gardeners, do our due diligence to understand how seeds grow, how plants reproduce themselves, uh, whether that's through sexual reproduction in seed set or it's through divisions and cuttings, which is clonal reproduction. 
And <clears throat> we understand how that's related to the security of our food systems and the security of our ecosystems. So, you know, I think that sounds like a lot of rhetoric, but the fact is the seeds are, are all are there. Um, but when we talk about biodiversity loss and climate change, their their habitats are being disrupted, and their uh, their diversity going into the future is something we need to keep our eyes on. So, really, it sounds like we human beings are the greatest danger to seeds <laughs> ourselves. Yes. I would Ultimately. I would say that that is absolutely true. I mean, when you think about these 300 species of flowering seed bearing plants and their coevolution on this planet for millions of years, like they know stuff we don't know. Yeah. They have been coevolving with fire, with drought, with flood, with with ice ages and and tropical, you know, heat waves for centuries. And so they are encoded with so much information about adaptation, evolution, working together in communities, finding their places and reproducing themselves. I think when you look at corporate consolidation of some of our major food crops like wheat, like rice, like soy, yeah. or the poisoning of large amounts of our seed with what is, you know, sort of quote unquote termed necessary uh, chemical interventions, fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, la la. It's us that needs to get out of the way and let the systems uh, work their knowledge uh, and us harness and support that knowledge more effectively for our long-term benefit, not our short-term profit. And it seems like a big part of the problem is that we come in with our very narrow preferences and focus on making particular seeds and particular, you know, uh, products of those seeds abundant and, uh, and push other ones that are really necessary for the entire structure of the ecosystem to uh to survive and and we and we put stress on everything because we think oh well the, only this is important because it's only important to us but we're ignoring the entire foundation to what supports us supports those plants and makes everything possible to begin with <laughs> I think that's true to some extent, but I would also say that when we say we choose to focus on only what works for us, the fact is that human gardeners across time and space, you know, whether you're talking about land-based peoples 350 years ago or us today, we love novelty. We actually love diversity, right? And you show me a new pea or zinnia and I'll be like, oh yeah, I want to try that one. It is that in the in the you know quote unquote interest of efficiency and convenience that our large scale producers right. have have predetermined for us the we that that you and I are most interested in yeah. which rice which soy which wheat is going to be the most easily grown at the greatest scale shipped the longest way in order to get the most profit out of it and then we the thus you know the the little people on the ground are sold this corn this wheat this soy these commodity level seeds and we see this contracting of a great biodiversity of such crops uh in the interest of of profit um and when this happens because there are so many acres dedicated to this large scale agriculture yeah. whether it's for biofuel or feed lots right that we are contracting biodiversity in two ways, both the biodiversity of these exact crops, but also the habitats that they have been uh, they have been given over to in the name of of large agriculture. And we know we can do better. That's right. the thing. And, and as you indicate, there are a lot of individual gardeners and smaller scale uh, farms that that do. Uh, work to produce or, or rather preserve the the diversity of of seeds that are are, are necessary to to make everything uh, work. Something that comes up for me, and maybe it's just because it's like you know I think back to my childhood and think of secret layers of supervillains. But but when it came up in the news, it came to me that we have a global seed vault in in yes. in, the, in the arctic the the svalbard yeah. global seed seed vault right and right. so and so and, and what does this do exactly because as i understand it that's working towards 
preserving the diversity of of, of, of seeds around the world as well. What, what, what is it? Where is it? And and is it in danger right now? So the the you know in in the state of seed in the world, one of the threads that I research and and sort of report on in in the book is the. Uh, this level of seed banking that has been going on by governments, by regions uh, across the globe since the late 1800s at this scale. I mean, communities of people have always saved their seed, stored their seed for the next season, shared it with each other. Like this is a small level of seed banking, very important, but on this large governmental scale, uh, these seed banks have been in existence since the late 1800s. Then the Mm. first recorded one was in Russia, uh, and the Vavilov Institute. Um, Fast forward to 2008, governments and organizations and regional seed banks, there are about 1,500, a little bit more than that across the globe currently, got together with the recognition that if, say, for instance, the California Botanic Garden seed banks as much of the biodiversity of the uh, flora of the California floristic province as it can. It is the regional seed bank for the native plants. Now, seed of food and seed of native plants is often separated as though they are they are different creatures. But in fact, they are directly interrelated. All of our crop food was once its wild progenitor in the ecosystem, right? Right. And we have selected it and bred it and hybridized it and done all these things, but they're directly related. So if something were to happen to the California Botanic Gardens seed bank, um, like a fire, a hurricane, an earthquake, whatever it might be, and, 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 and it that. might be because we're, and it might be. we're, we know we're, we're facing that we more are. often. Yeah, Right, right. I mean, we had the hurricane hit Southern California <laughs> right. this year. Right. So if something happens to that seed bank, that library of the biodiversity of the California Floristic Province has to be started again. So there are two ways of conserving seed. One is in place in the ecosystems where it exists on the planet, in the woods, in the fields, in the meadows, on the coastline. That's in situ conservation. Ex situ conservation is when you are conserving that seed off site in some place like a a seed bank. So all of these seed banks got together and they decided that we needed sort of a mothership, if you will, a backup copy of the backup copies. So if the California Botanic Garden uh, seed bank is a backup copy of our native flora, the Svalbard Um, accession of that collection is a backup copy of the seed bank where it exists. Wow. And, and you know, it, it sort of seems like redundancy and it is. And if you learn any lesson from seeds and plants that bear seeds, it's that redundancy is a very good idea. You don't want to have one (laughs) seed. You want to have 5 million seeds. And, And then if you're lucky, some small portion of them will not go to be feed or rot and become compost, but will actually become the plants. So- Svalbard. Am I answering your question? And I'll keep going. No, no, no. With, keep it. No, okay. it's 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 a winding road, but I, it's fascinating. Please. Okay, good. So Svalbard is this big seed bank, thirteen hundred miles north of the Arctic Circle in the Svalbard Archipelago. It is administered by the Norwegian government and a large non international nonprofit called the Crop Trust. But it was the result of a lot of collaboration between many countries and regions and seed banks. It opened in 2008, and almost immediately its importance was demonstrated when uh, one of our longstanding seed banks in uh, Aleppo, Syria, Mm. came under attack during the Syrian war. And this is, of course, a, you know, a common uh, strategy of humankind across time and space in times of war that if you want to control or dominate um, another group of people or piece of land, go after their food. Salt the fields. And, um, yeah, exactly. So, and, and we've seen it time and time again. Uh, but in this case, the seed bank in Aleppo, which was, which was holding the collection for the dry land, important food crops of that region going back centuries. So we're talking about like the biodiversity hotspot for wheat 
biodiversity on our planet and other dry land crops of the region. And it was a tax.